All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And happy that we're here instead of getting Sally and um, coming in. I was, was thinking we'd probably end up canceling class and, you know, having to figure out how to expedite the course even more. So glad that we're here or able to have class, um, even though having a rain day is kind of nice, a hurricane day. Um, last time we left off here with sedimentation, so we're going to pick up here. I kind of just left the notes that where we had them last time uh, to begin with. We were talking about how sedimentation works, how we can model it mathematically based on a particle that we, we have some assumptions about it. They're spherical. We assume that we need to remove, if we want to remove all of them, we've got to start at the top of the water column and it's got to sink all the way to the bottom before bottom of our sedimentation basin. Uh, before it exits the basin, and that, that constitutes removal. Um, so I just wanted to expand this just a little bit further today, uh, explain how we can take a look at what percentage of particles will be removed if we don't get all of them, um, look at a couple other uh, sedimentation reactor basin types that we can use, and then get into coagulation. Um, just a couple quick announcements first. If you didn't turn in your homework, please do so. Um, for those online, uh, you should be able to do that through Moodle. Again, uh, my preference for online submissions is that it's a PDF that's uh, one document. That makes it a lot easier for me to grade rather than flipping through four different documents for your pages. Um, I gave some advice if you use a smartphone, there's a, you can look at the syllabus, it kind of gives you some directions, but there's an app called um, Office Lens, and it can take pictures of whiteboards, sheets of paper, and make it into a nice PDF that's um, very readable and kind of accounts for angles and stuff like that. That kind of makes it um, conveniently more professional and easier to read. So that, that's my recommendation. I appreciate it if you do use that. Um, for the last homework, we'll, we'll be doing it all online, so that's uh, going to be applicable for everyone. Um, and if we go fully online at some point, then um, there'll be that too. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, so you just got to do one or the other, right? One on submission. Yeah. Or one or the other. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to do both um, for this. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to <coughs> remind you was I, <coughs> excuse me, I posted a quiz. Well, in this case, it's really a participation um, thing. So I've got my Moodle and student view here. And if you go down to the assignments and exams, uh, we've got the, uh, the homework. If you go down to quizzes, we've got um, really just feedback this time. I'm asking you to complete this by Thursday. Tell, tell me what you think about the course so far. How are things going? If you have any, um, any feedback for me, I will appreciate it. And this will give you um, participation credit for um, basically for the start of the semester. I don't, I don't always start um, these participation things the first week or so because there's still people dropping and adding. Um, so I will collect this one just for a participation grade. There's no, no wrong answers this time. So just give me your honest answers. And then starting, um, what I'll plan to do is before uh, a week from today, I'll post another um, an actual kind of quiz type thing. It'll give you some basic questions. Uh, most of it will be counted for you um, for free, participation grade, and just a little bit to challenge your knowledge on what we've, what we've been doing. Um, so you're guaranteed to get something like a 70% on it, and then for every right answer, you get closer to 100. So that's kind of how I'm doing that. It should be a relatively easy, just keep you engaged, keep, um, make sure you are learning some of the stuff that I don't feel like testing you on an exam, uh, that level of importance, but I think it's important for this topic that you learn. Okay, so if you got any questions about that, do let me know. Um, so this one's, this one's due Thursday. Uh, the next one I'll, I'll have you do by, before Tuesday because I think that'll make more sense. All right.
Okay, so with that, we'll get to the PowerPoint. All right, so last time, as I mentioned, we were looking at particle settling. We were comparing, in particular, the settling velocity of a given particle, so Vs. Now, Vs can be, you know, maybe we have Vs1 versus, you know, so that's particle number one versus Vs number two, something like that. We can imagine different um, settling velocities given different particles, right? So the Vs is our observation, what's happening with a given particle, whereas V0 is our critical settling velocity. That's kind of our design parameter. That's the, the one particle that is settled perfectly, starts at the top and ends just at the bottom in a clarifier like this. So that's, you know, if we decide we're going to remove exactly 100% of this particular particle, then we're going to set that particular particle equal to V0, the Vs equal to V0 in that case. Uh, otherwise, we're comparing so we've designed our reactor, then we're comparing some settling velocity from some other particle. How does that compare to this design velocity? So that's the difference between Vs and V0. And so when we analyze these systems, we're going to say, okay, well, if the settling velocity is for the, excuse me, if the critical settling velocity is greater than the observed one, then not all of the particles are going to be settled. Like we see this one here. Uh, whereas if if they're the same or if the settling velocity is greater than that design velocity, this purple case, they will all be settled. Okay, uh, and then we also derived uh, this equation here. If we do set, um, set this up, we can define that critical settling velocity based on how long it takes for the particle to reach the bottom. So what we need is, so velocity is going to be distance per time, right? The, the distance in this case, we have to go the full length, full height of the reactor. So uh, we're going to say HP is equal to H. So this H is what we're looking at, the height of the basin. And we're going to divide that by the amount of time it stays in the basin, right? That's, that's our hydraulic retention time. That's theta or V over Q. So we said V naught is equal to H divided by that theta. It's the same thing as writing H divided by V divided by Q. That volume, so in this case that's the volume term, we can say that's going to be the same as the length times the width times the height. The heights cancel, we're left, left with the length times the width, or the area of the basin, here. And from there we can simplify and say, okay, well our V naught then is equal to the flow rate divided by length times width, width, which is flow rate divided by the area of the basin. Okay, so that gives us a, a simple term to know exactly what our critical settling velocity is based on the, the parameters, the design parameters of the reactor. Okay, so then that, that's one way we can either design our reactor dimensions and flow rate based on the type of particle we want to remove or we can know what particles can be removed based on the parameters there. Okay, so that's going to be very important. I think I've given you that on the uh, formula sheet, but it's simple enough that you should know it regardless. So double check that as you study. Make sure that either that's on there or you commit it to memory. Um, actually, I can just go ahead and do you a favor and, and pull it up to, to check. So I, I do recommend this as a study um, method, by the way, as you're going through notes um, and you're working on problems, check to see what's on here and check to make sure that you know uh, exactly um, what formulas, you know, what, what parts of the formulas are important and, um, you know, what you need here. So in your, in your mind, you could say, okay, well, I've got the settling velocity, but I do need to commit it to memory that the V naught is equal to Q over AB, right? You could derive that in, in on the exam if you if you really felt like it, just based on the definition of a velocity, distance over time, how much time do you have in there? Um, but it may be worth committing that to memory. V naught is equal to Q over AB. All right. So um, to continue.
just wanted to, to make a note. So if we're looking at a cross section, um, so we could either be looking at aerial view here or the cross section, you know, the area of the basin here is very obvious. If, if we're looking at an aerial view here, this is area of the basin equals length times the width, where this would be the length, this would be the width. <laughs> area of a circle here, you know that, pi r squared. Um, so depending on what type of basin you have, you know, you might have to do the different things. And keep in mind that if you, if you are working with a circular basin and then you take the cross section, um, so this is still going to be the area of your basin, but when you're drawing it, if you look, if you're considering it, you know, kind of a cylindrical thing, and you draw your radius out, you can still end up looking at a rectangular cross section here um, to match what we were drawing in this case, right? So the that schematic in terms of um, and this would just be a cylinder, right? The schematic in terms of how the particle falls as it goes across the basin is going to be the same rectangular sort of deal. All right. Okay, so I think that's that's about it for the, the those equations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a couple unconventional designs. Um, unconventional meaning that these aren't, you know, the standard practice, but you can do them. Uh, first would be the a high rate settler and you can make use of the fact that your basin has you know your really your control parameter if this is your basin here your control parameter is really that area of the basin that's available for particles to settle onto and in this case so I'm just trying to draw kind of the background here for you okay so in this case this high rate settler would be adding a bunch of shelves. So it's artificially increasing the surface area of the, the basin down here. You still have this. And as water is flowing through, you usually incline the shelves. And so as water is going through, the particles can settle all along these gray area uh, spots before it, before it leaves. Now, this, um, is pretty obvious a, a pretty obvious way to increase your surface area but there are some drawbacks in terms of okay how are you scraping the particles out of here to clean it um, and what are you going to do to make sure that those particles aren't getting back into the water uh, that's part of why you would angle them a little bit um, this is probably a little exaggerated here but there's different different strategies to clean um, maybe a mechanical scraper at the bottom um, so it introduces a little more complexity a uh, little more chance for um, issues with the flow rate. If if you had some irregularity, then it might become a bigger problem. Um, and again, the, the shelves probably going to be inclined a little bit. It's not actual actually for the particle settling itself, but rather just as a way so that you can direct the particles away, make it easier to collect them if they if they're just naturally kind of falling, you know, leftward on this this screen um, that'll become easier to collect them over there okay so that's that's one option um, and uh, let's see this is I apologize I where's my cursor don't listen to this this is for the next slide and I will um, you know what I'm just going to go ahead and delete it now so that that's not confusing See if I can go back and erase this. Nope. Okay. All right. So I'll clean this up uh, a little bit later. So that's unconventional settlers. That's uh, just a quick look at how you could potentially improve uh, the base design. Another way to operate a sedimentation basin would be what's called an upflow design. And this one's kind of an all or nothing thing. And that's what I had this, this writing up here in the corner for. 
So the way these are going to work is instead of flowing across, um, you know, coming maybe from the middle out to the sides for a circular one, or um, just from one side to the other for a typical rectangular one, you're going to have flow coming from the bottom. So this is going to be your flow rate. And then be collected essentially upwards here. Um, so the queue is continuing to flow upward. Really, you're, you're harvesting it probably over the edge. But effect, effectively, your flow is going upward, right? So in this design, you're actually f competing with the particles. You know, the, this upward velocity of the water is actually competing with the downward velocity of the particles, which, you know, intuitively, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you're kind of forcing them to be falling faster than otherwise. So it's not used very often, uh, but there is one kind of clever thing you can do here, and that's if you look at your velocity, your upward velocity term here, um, given this area down here at the bottom, you're, you're putting that flow right through kind of a slightly narrow area. It's, the velocity is going rather quickly, and if you taper it outward, then your velocity term here for water reaching the top is going to be smaller. So this V2, um, we can say that V1 is going to be greater than V2. So you can actually design it so that that, that velocity of water going out is relatively small. So then your settling velocity really just has to compare to that V2. So We'll say Vs um, is kind of compared to V2. OK. So that's, that's kind of uh, an interesting way to do it. And then what you'll notice is you'll, if particles are not, you know, if they are settling faster than that velocity, then they will start, you know, they'll get to some point and they just will stop and then maybe start sinking. And it actually allows for particles to collide and go through the flocculation, coagulation, that kind of stuff, and ultimately form larger particles that will start sinking. Um, and sometimes you'll get like a blanket effect where the, these particles sort of form a blanket and it all sort of sinks. So there's, there's a couple of dynamics here that are um, maybe a little more interesting, sometimes, sometimes applicable. But essentially, if that design velocity is uh, lower than or equal to, in this design velocity meaning um, this V2, so we'll say V2 is equal to our V0. So if our settling is happening faster than that critical settling velocity, um, then we get everything removed. All the particles are traveling downward faster than upward at that point. Um, if not, they're all just going to escape just because of the advection term of the water going upwards. So it's kind of an interesting setup. We're not going to deal much with it, but it's, um, it is one other technology out there uh, in that regard. OK. So last, last little bit here, I wanted to come back to the traditional case and talk about, OK, you know, we just looked at a case where it's all or nothing. Well, what about the partial case for our traditional designs? Um, the partial removal of particles. So we can imagine a, a VS here where we have a particle starting at the top and it doesn't make it to the bottom, right? So this could be some VS, but the same VS, you know, the same slope here, starting somewhere uh, downward in the water column may get removed. So we, we can take a look at um, this distance here, from here to here. You know, all those particles um, are certainly not making it, uh, not being removed, but everything below that should be. So that portion right there are going to be the ones that um, are going to escape. And we can kind of see that intuitively because, um, you know, just the, that that's kind of the cutoff. And this, again, is assuming uh, laminar flow. 
we're not having vertical mixing of particles here. And it's a pretty good, a pretty good approximation. So let's call this x here, that, that difference there. Um, that's going to be the same, you know, just from geometry, we know that's going to be the same as this distance. And then we can say, okay, this remaining amount, we'll just call this y. Okay, so if we have those, then when we see that, you know, first of all, we see that, okay, if Vs is less than V0, that's when we have this partial removal, right? Um, and that's our case right here. Because if we were to draw the V0 from this top left corner to the bottom right corner, that would be steeper than this Vs that we're looking at. All right, so in this case, um, the height that the particles are going to effectively um, effectively uh, the height that we the full height sorry excuse me the full height is the x plus h right so this is just the height of the reactor is um, x plus y so that's that's just obvious from how I drew it so if we if we were to take a look at the percentage that are removed, really we want to say, okay, well, what percent of, of this is y? So let's just rearrange for y, and we can say that's just um, h minus x. So that's kind of the fraction of, the, of this water column where particles are going to be removed. Okay? So then, and, and we know, so this is, we can just say is removed. So just based on those assumptions, we can say, all right, well, whatever portion that is, that's going to be our fraction. Um, and as an example, if we had, you know, if this was exactly the 50% mark, we would say, well, if from the 50% mark we had removal, then 50% of the particles are going to be removed. So, you know, we're assuming they're equally distributed throughout the whole system. Um, so then the way we're going to define this um, from here is simply that p is the percentage of particles removed and p is going to be equal to this observed vs divided by v naught times 100 percent um, and this you know th this uh y equals h minus x thing that's just to show you kind of mathematically how we can derive that and this um, vs over v naught is really just giving us the same term uh, just comparing how far it's going to fall, you know, in the v naught case, it's going to fall the full h. In the vs case, it's just going to fall however much we drew here, um, this y, right? So that's giving us that comparison of essentially y divided by h. Um, that fraction of how much of y compared to, how much is y compared to the total? So vs divided by v naught is essentially, you know, if we if we give it the same amount of time, this is that y term divided by h. Okay, so then that's a fraction, so we'll turn that to 100 uh, percent, or to a percentage by multiplying by 100 percent, and that gives us this percentage of particles removed. Okay, and if you if you knew the percentage and needed to know the Vs term or the V0 term, you could you could rearrange and solve that, that as well. Okay. As an example, I mentioned the 50%. Um, yeah, I got a question. Oh, so escape, is that like the particle that escaped from, from where? Yeah, so when I wrote escape, that means escaping from the sedimentation tank. So they're not settled. Because if you look, any particles that were here, they made it to the edge, the right edge here, mm -hmm. that means they did not get settled. Because they, they get settled when they hit the bottom. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's, it's, that's what's coming out of the tank. Yeah, that's the fraction that's not removed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so an, a good, an easy example is just simply the, uh, the 50%. So let's, where's my... 
if we were to take a look at, um, let's say Vs equals one half of V naught, um, if that's the case, then Vs divided by V naught um, would would give us 0.5. And then we can multiply that by 100 percent, gives us 50 percent particle removal. Okay. All right. So from there, I wanted to give a bit of a practice. So we, here's an example from the book. We have silt removal, removal in a clarifier. So I'm going to read the prompt, give you a few minutes to take a look, um, apply, apply this knowledge, and then work it through with you. Um, after that, we'll get into coagulation. Uh, so example 6.1 says, a drinking water treatment plant uses a circular sedimentation basin to treat 3 million gallons per day of, of river water. And it gives the conversion there. Um, it's a flow rate. After a storm occurs upstream, the river often carries 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles with an average density of 2.2 grams per centimeter cubed. The silt must be removed before the water can be used. The plant's clarifier is 3.5 meters deep, 21 meters in diameter. The water is 15 degrees Celsius. And then we are asked, A, what is the hydraulic detention time of the clarifier, and B, Will the clarifier remove all of the silt particles from the river water? Okay, so I've got a couple of the parameters you'll need um, written here. And kind of just a summary of, of the question. So A is asking, what is our theta? What is that hydraulic retention time? And B, what is, um, are all of the particles going to be removed? Which is really asking us to compare the design, uh, design velocity versus the sedimentation velocity of those particles. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it on the larger screen for a, a couple minutes for you to read and start um, start working on it and then I'm going to move it back over here so you have those parameters as you need. Um, so just initially um, you know, for part B you're going to be needing to solve that equation that we we're working with last time, the sedimentation velocity. Um, so I'll write that up here in a few minutes, or you can look it up. Um, and we're going to be using these, these values given for uh, these particular particles. So we've got a diameter for the particles, a density for the particles, and the temperature value is going to give us the density of the water and the dynamic viscosity of water. Okay, so there's going to be some unit conversions involved. Um, I'll give you a few minutes here. Just let me know if you've got questions. Yes. So, and for those of you online, anytime we're dealing with a circular sedimentation basin, we're just going to assume it's that standard type where if you're looking at an aerial view, and this is a, a great question demonstrating why you always want to draw your diagrams. Water is going to flow from the center outward towards uh, the edges at any radius, right? So that it's just going to look like this. That's the direction of flow anywhere. And our typical model works just because you take one cross section and, and do it that way.
Okay, so part A should be relatively straightforward. The area of a, of, excuse me, the volume of a cylinder with the conversions given there um, should be able to get 2.6 hours for the hydraulic residence time. Now, you may have put it in days or seconds or something, but um, and we may need to convert it in the future, but that, that should be um, equivalent once you convert. dp is the diameter of the particle
All right, so I, I went ahead and solved the V naught for you. Uh, it's just Q over AB. Gonna need to do some conversions again for the Q. Uh, already essentially solved for AB here when you did the volume term, pi dp, dB squared over four, so that's the diameter of the basin. Um, and you should get 3.8 times 10 to the negative fourth meters per second. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as 38 times 10 to the minus fifth because we'll find that the Vs term is gonna be in uh, basically that, um, that range. So when we solve for Vs, it'll just be a little easier to directly compare that way. Um, a, few, a few conversions to keep in mind as we do this. Um, first, the rho for the particle, this was given to us in, um, what was it there, grams per centimeter squared. So 2.2 grams per centimeter cubed rather. Um, we need that really in kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, so if you do the conversions, um, you'll find that you know you divide by 1,000 for the grams, and you're going to end up multiplying by um, a lot more than that to convert this cubic centimeter into cubic meters. So ultimately, you end up with 2,200 kilograms per cubic meter. And one little tip I'll give you is you can actually take a look the um, the units for density of water in the kilograms per cubic meter. Those are what you need to be working with anyway because you, you need meters and kilograms. So anytime we're dealing with a particle, it's pretty much going to have be on the same order. So uh, you can double check that you know this is about a thousand. Okay, this is two thousand. That should give you some comfort to say, okay, you're you're on the right order of things that you didn't tell me that you have a particle density that's like a thousand times bigger than the, the water density because they're going to be relatively close and the particle should be more dense. Um, so if you had a, if you got 220 or something, you'd be like, oh wait, the particle's less dense than water. That means it's floating. That doesn't make sense um, in this problem. So that's a good way to, to kind of check your uh, units there. Okay, so that's one conversion you would need. Um, and it, just as a reminder, when you're converting for, for that cubic, you know, you're, you're trying to go from um, cubic centimeters, there's 100 centimeters per one meter. And you cube on the outside of these, right? So. Uh, in order to do that conversion, you have to cube that 100 with it, and that's why it becomes um, such a big number when you're doing that conversion. Okay, and doing the full thing, you you basically take the 2.2 times um, one kilogram per 1,000 grams multiplied by this um, times that 2.2, and then you get your your answer there. Okay, so that's that's kind of one of the major things. The other one would be the diameter of the particle, so dp, and this was given to us as 0 0.01 millimeters. Um, we know that uh, to be 0 0.000, 000 so four zeros. Just have to make sure I have that right. Zero one meters. If you just divide this one by a thousand get it to the meters, um, or really that's uh, 10 times 10 to the minus uh, fifth meters, or 10 times 10 to the minus six, sorry. Um, anyway, so that's our, our meter value. You can put that in scientific notation, but once you, once you have that, then everything should be now in kilograms, meters, and seconds. So then you can put in your, put everything into this equation and solve um, again, acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. So then you have a Vs comes out to be 5.74.
uh, times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second. And if we do that comparison, the 38 versus the 5.74, we see that the critical settling velocity is much higher than the actual settling velocity of these particles. That means these particles are not settling fast enough to match or exceed that critical point. So comparing, we see that actually Vs is smaller than V0, which means um, the answer to the problem is no, not all are removed. Yeah, and you could do that calculation to see what percentage removes. And just looking at looking at those two numbers, the 38 versus the 5.7, that looks like it would be something around 6%. Now that's like what settles, or that's what comes out? That would be the amount settles. Um, because if you take a look, you know, it, to get 100% of them, you need 38 times 7 minus 5th. What we have is just 5. But the question here was just asking specifically what was, you know, what, whether or not they all were all removed. But that's a good question, and it, yeah, that's a, a good thing to practice. When you see a problem like this, well, you could ask yourself, okay, well, what percentage does that mean or correspond to, um, or, or even how big would the particle have to be in order for them all to be settled? You can develop this into your own practice problem just by following up with some, some other questions like that. Okay, so we were, we've done sedimentation, so we've already started. So next would be coagulation. So we've done the primary sedimentation, that was a good example of it. And in that case, we did not have adequate settling so the next thing we do is we dose it with a coagulant. And um, we're going to talk about why they work, how they work, and just start to, to talk briefly about um, the math of the flocculation. Um, so really what I'm going to talk about now is coagulants, how and why they work, particle stability, how we can manipulate it, and in general the coagulant dosing um, we'll cover this a little bit when we talk about the flocculation mixing, but it's really a small reactor where it's a CSTR, very small and a very high flow rate, and it just is rapidly mixing um, here in this step and just moves right along very quickly. So it's, we, we don't really do a lot with modeling that reactor in particular. It just goes in, mixes, we're injecting a bunch of the chemicals, and making sure it's well mixed before it goes into the flocculation chambers. Okay, and then ultimately the goal here is to have a second sedimentation after we make larger particles, use that gravity again, and see what else we can uh, remove. Okay, so it's worthwhile to take a look at what actually we're removing and what size um, you know, what size corresponds to what types of particles. So if we think about the silt particles we just did a problem with, um, they said they were uh, 0 0.001 uh, millimeters. Millimeters are 1,000 times bigger than micrometers. So those silt particles should be in this range, okay? Um, so algae is also in that range. Fog particles are in that range. It's kind of the smaller end of pollen, human hairs can be that small, um, and we're, our visible eye is just getting to the point where we can, we can almost see those silt particles that we were describing, um, but maybe not quite, uh, or large silt particles perhaps we can. And that might make sense if you take a, a look at some clay or some very fine um, soil from the water or just from from the ground and you look you try to discern the the boundary of a grain layer you'll be hard pressed to do so but maybe you can do some with some of the larger of the particles okay um, in terms of 
some other things that we might want to remove. Well, bacteria at the very largest are about that size. So most of them are going to be smaller, harder to remove. Some of them get quite small even. Um, so a lot of the bacteria, you know, if we weren't able to remove all that silt, certainly we're not removing bacteria directly. Now bacteria could um, stick onto larger particles. So actually one reason why we want to remove the particles so they don't get protected, the bacteria don't piggyback onto a particle that maybe protects it from the ultraviolet light or other, other processes. Um, and maybe we can get some removal that way, just settle, settling the particles out. Uh, there's some other things, these Giardia cysts and Cryptosporidium cysts. Those are, um, they're still single cellular, single cellular organisms, but they're not bacteria, they're a little bit larger. They tend to form these cysts um, that are quite resistant to chlorine and, and some other processes. Um, it's another pathogen Basically, they're, they're kind of like amoeba, they're protozoa, um, eukaryotic instead of prokaryotic, if you remember from biology. Um, we're interested in removing those from our water treatment systems, and we'll, we'll touch on them a little bit more later. Uh, but potentially, we can remove them with uh, sedimentation. Again, a little smaller than those silt particles that we were just looking at. Viruses are going to be way too small, um, but perhaps if we um, cause them to stick to some other larger particles, we may remove some of them. So ultimately, we're not, this is not a disinfection process. We're not capable of uh, that level of treatment with just sedimentation, but we're getting to the point where you know, we can remove a fair bit of the algae um, and some of the stuff that these pathogens may stick to. Okay, when we think about particle stability and particle instability, what I'm talking about is why they are stable floating around in solution. Uh, if you think about the Mississippi, uh, you know just by looking at it, it's filled with all sorts of particles that are floating around in the solution. Now, the, the, the solution color um, can be driven by the color of the particles, or it can be driven by chemicals that are just absorbing light, um, that are dissolved in the water. So there's a difference. If you look at a nice glass of iced tea or something, and you can see right through it, but the, the light that you see going through is, is now, what you see is brown, right? Everything looking through it, some of the colors are missing. That's a good example of a chemical that's dissolved. It's not scattering light. Um, you can still see clearly through it, but it's colored, right? That's different than particles which are gonna scatter light. If we look at a uh, solution, let's say you accidentally get a bunch of you, you break your tea bag and you get all that in the tea and then you're looking through it, it, it may look muddier, right? Especially if you have very fine tea bags or uh, tea leaves grindings. If you look at mud um, kicked up uh, maybe in the Mississippi or something, that sediment is going to be scattering light so you can't see very far through the water. So that's caused by these particles that are floating around. Um, and so the question is why are they floating around and not sticking to each other, uh, because sometimes th they could stick to each other. Uh, the answer really is a force balance between repulsive um, forces and attractive forces. The primary repulsive force pushing particles away from each other is what we call electrostatic. So you've heard that before. Um, this is going to be, so what I'll do is I'll highlight this electrostatic here in red. So that electrostatic force is really caused by the fact that in general particles almost always have kind of a net negative charge on their surface. This does get back a bit to chemistry, surface chemistry. Um, there's just often hydroxyl groups and other type of groups that are hanging around and this bit of acid base. You can affect this with by pH. If you get a very low pH, it tends to can flip this. But in general, most particles in environmental samples are going to have a net negative surface charge. Um, so with this, what's going to happen is, well, you could imagine a direct repulsion between like charges. That's you know the electrostatic repulsion there. Um, but actually, what's going to happen is. In solution, we have some sort of salts, so we have 
positive ions, and I'm going to circle the ions here, and they get attracted here, right up next to the surface, on both sides. And this creates a layer, an ionic layer. And then we have another layer of negative ions that gets attracted to that one. Now it becomes a little bit more loose here. Maybe there's some positive ones mixed around. Uh, the effect is diminishing as it gets further, but it's still kind of there. So we see this, this proximity now of what we call this electrical double layer. So double layer meaning it's, it flips um, charges twice. This net effect here is we have this distance between the surface, the particle surface, and this extended charge that goes out um, away from the particle surface and gives, um, gives this charge barrier, right? This um, force field, literally, uh, in a way. Um, so this, is, this would then be the edge or the uh, distance of, of really this charge effect. So what I'm going to do instead of right, right here, what I'll say is this is the electrical double layer. This is EDL. That's how we, how we describe that. And that goes out maybe 10, 20 nanometers into solution away from the particle surface. Okay, and this obviously is going to repel other particles that are charged likewise. So immediately one thing you see is in order to counteract this, because this is kind of the normal way of being, this is when particles are stable, this repulsion is repelling them from each other. If they're destabilized and they start sticking together and then they will come out of solution more quickly because you're forming larger particles and we know larger particles sediment faster. Okay, so and again that, that larger particles sedimenting faster that's from our VS equation where we have stuff and then diameter of the particle squared over other stuff. That diameter of the particle squared means that that diameter is really impactful, right? So that's, if we're increasing the diameter of the particles by sticking more of them together, we'll have faster sedimentation. Okay. So coming back to here, uh, one way we could destabilize them is cause a positive charge on the surface. If they're positively charged, if one of them pos is positively charged, then the negative ones will stick to it, right? So if we flip some of them, um, that could work. All right, um, so that's, that's the repulsion. Um, I also wanted to describe briefly the, um, the attractive. So the van der Waals here, the van der Waals forces, they're shorter ranged, but they're going to be, um, whenever they find another particle, they're going to attract each other. So you can imagine these are like the electron clouds, the, um, the spin of the nucleus, things like that. They ha there's, there's a set of properties of, at the atomic level um, that their forces depend on the distance away from the surface by a, a large factor. It's like radius to the sixth or radius to the fourth compared to the electrical double layer, which is radius squared. Um, so this one diminishes quickly, but not as quickly. So if the van der Waals forces, it's like, um, actually geckos use this. If you see a gecko climbing on a glass, a glass wall, they're using van der Waals forces between their, their sticky um, fingers and uh, the surface. So it's a very strong attractive force. It's not it's not going to like cause a chemical reaction, but it's it sticks there, um, uh, and it's uh, quite effective. But it's shorter range. So if we looked at the distance here, it's like maybe a few nanometers versus this longer range um, other one. You don't really need to know a lot about what causes the van der Waals forces, um, but it's just a, a suite of different. Um, different interactions. Okay, so the point there is if we can cause this electrical double layer to shrink so that it becomes about the, the distance of the van der Waals, then the van der Waals may be able to outcompete it. As soon as they're able to get close enough, the van der Waals should 
because it's a fairly strong um, force, especially when you get closer and closer, should overwhelm them and allow particles to stick together. Okay, so that's kind of what we're trying to have happen when we do coagulation. We're adding a coagulant that should allow that process to happen. Okay, one last chemistry um, concept here. And this is going to be rather straightforward, and I'm introducing it now because really this is the only time we're going to use it, and that's ionic strength. So you've probably heard of this before. Um, this is really just a measure of how much ions are in solution. And the kind of how many ions, but also multiplied by their charge, by the effect of their charge. So um, when we think about the surface of some ion here, so or some uh, particle, excuse me, and we imagine those ions that are surrounding it or coming to the surface, if we have all positive charges, you know, here, and then as a set of negative charges, well, there's going to be a difference if we have, um, let's say, a 2 plus instead of a 1 plus. So if we were to take both of these away and replace that with one ion that had plus plus, it satisfies more space, or it, it occupies less space to have that one ion, and it, that effect can shrink this whole area. Uh, because it's satisfying two of these charges with less ion, right? So that's one thing that can happen, and we can actually have three plus. Um, another thing that can happen uh, is just if we add more, more ions, then it's going to condense, condense and compress it. So I have a few slides that I meant to bring into this PowerPoint. Uh, maybe I'll bring them up um, during another an old set of slides that I have. Um, but we can we can take a look at I, I'll show them next time. But we can take a look at how how much of an impact that has on this double layer by observing okay how much salt does it take let's say until we destabilize the particles. So if we add more and more salt, um, there's just more and more ions around um, in solution. It's actually going to compress that, and this is a, a feature of um, osmotic the osmotic forces, osmotic pressure, to really, you know, if we've got very few ions, it's going to try to stretch them away from the particle because osmotic pressure is pulling them. If we've got tons of ions, they'll just pack in there really close. So one thing we can do is just increase the ionic strength to cause destabilization. Because once we pack enough ions here so that the, the electrical double layer gets really short, we've got all those ions packed in there, then um, the van der Waals forces can take over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure to bring those slides next time, uh, kind of demonstrate that with some data. Okay, the point being here, uh, if we define ionic strength, I, as one half times the sum of the concentration of the particles times their charge squared, uh, that's our equation for ionic strength, and I'm going to give you this on the formula sheet. Um, this is going to give us uh, a number concentration of effective charge. And so really what's happening is we're taking the molar concentration here multiplied by a given ion's charge squared, summing all the different species like that, um, and dividing by two. So as I mentioned, increasing the ionic strength will directly decrease the electrical double layer, leading us to destabilization once we get it, when we, once we shrink it enough. Okay, so a quick example here. If, you ha if I dissolved 100 milligrams per liter of magnesium chloride, MgCl2, um, I'm going to have you find the molar concentration of magnesium, the molar concentration of chloride, and the ionic strength. Um, I will get you the molecular weights or the atomic weights here in a moment. Um, but just note that what we have here is two chloride ions, Cl minus, and one magnesium ion, 2 plus, for every um, one molecule that dissolves. Okay, and I gave it to you in milligrams per liter, so you, no worries about the volume. 
um, chloride that should be 35 point I think it's four five grams per mole and I will look up magnesium for you because I don't have that Okay, so if you do the magnesium, that should be, if I did this right, 0 0.0041 moles per liter. Uh, the chloride will be similar, point, point, uh, 0 0.1 grams per liter. Divide that by 2 moles for every um, 1 mole of the uh, magnesium chloride times the Uh, actually, that's probably the wrong way, wrong place to put it. Um, we're gonna have two moles of Cl minus per one mole of MgCl2. Then multiply. We can multiply by that by the 0.1 grams per liter, which is 100 milligrams per liter, uh, divided by the 35.45 grams per mole. Oh yes, you're right. You're right. I was. I'm doing this wrong. You're exactly right. So, and I apologize because I was trying to to rush through here a little bit. I I took the wrong route here. I was treating it as if I had dissolved 100 milligrams of each um, magnesium alone and Cl2 alone. Um, you guys are exactly right to call me out on that. That's the wrong. 
the wrong way to go about it. Oh, and I need to delete that. Okay, so essentially, um, what I should have done was I should have calculated the molecular weight of MgCl2 and converted that. Um, so the molecular weight here of MgCl2 would be two times the 35.45 plus plus the 24.3. You get that, and what did you guys get for that? 95.2. Okay, so from there we take 100 milligrams per liter, or 0.1 grams per liter. Go through this process here to find um, the concentrations here. I, I apologize. I I wrote this example out on my notes, but I didn't have it solved in my notes. So just, um, and then I was thinking of the timing, and I was just rushed it. So I will clean this up. I will write in the answers here for you when I post this. Um, I'm going to move on from this right now so we can cover just a little bit more. But I'll fill this in. It's a good exercise for you. Make sure you're comfortable with the chemistry. Um, and a, a follow-up example, if we take the ionic strength, and I'll write out the equation here. So um, a second example to follow up, basically find the ionic strength. If we have a similar case except 50 milligrams per liter of the magnesium chloride added to 50 milligrams per liter of NaCl. The point here is we have two different sources of Cl, um, but only one concentration of Cl. This, you know, we put the we combine both of these sources into one concentration here is, is kind of the point. So again, I will I will write this up um, when I post the notes. For the sake of time, I'm not going to do much more than write out what this is going to look like. So here the equation for the ionic strength should look like this. So that should be your equation for the ionic strength. And again, just to you know, make sure that you're familiar with this concept of chemistry where you have two sources of chloride, but it's really one total chloride concentration that you're going to be dealing with. Okay, um, This will be good for you to go ahead and give that a, a try, um, kind of as, as some practice. Um, and what you'll see is the, you know, there's a, there is a difference here because in terms of the total ionic strength, even though it sounds like 50 milligrams of each is about the same as 100 milligrams of this one. Well, there's a few differences in the presence of magnesium with a 2 plus makes a big, um, that squaring of that, of the charge makes a big difference. Um, in practice, um, I think I had, okay. In practice, let me just write this one thing. We often use alum or aluminum sulfate, which is Al2SO4-3. Um, this is what we often, we often end up with this. Um, we often use this in practice because we end up with Al3 plus and SO4 is a two minus. Okay, so it's highly charged species there and we can actually salt out the um, aluminum afterwards. So that's, that's something we often use um, for a coagulant. Um, sometimes we also add charged polymers that can go in and make use of the fact that a positive charged branch of something can stick to a particle and then connect it with some other particle, um, kind of like that. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this uh, here at the moment like, like it is and um, again, I encourage you to fill this out. I will go ahead and solve it for you as well and post that when I post these notes um, along with the example prior to this. Um, when we're talking about flocculation, and I'll, I'll wrap up with just introducing um, the concept here. We'll, uh, we'll finish out the flocculation next time. So flocculation, we're forming these flocks, and the question is how long do we need to allow this coagulant to work 
how fast should we be mixing it to cause these particles to um, stick together properly. Uh, we don't care about settling yet, we just maybe care about their sedimentation speed. We're just trying to cause them to stick together so that when we do settle them, it'll happen faster. They'll, they will um, fall out of solution more easily in our second clarifier. So when we do this, we're going to give gentle mixing. We get that the collisions without breaking them apart, without that turbulence. And our goal is to reduce the N, capital N over time. This is our number concentration of particles. So as N decreases, that means we've had several small particles that were floating around in a solution creating larger particles. Um, so if we had four particles here, then we have one particle now that was made up of four of the smaller particles. So that's kind of our goal. Um, and the question is for this section, because this is where we're going to um, start coming back to our mass balance equations, is how quickly or how can we know that rate of reaction? So there's some reaction that's causing these particles to stick together. That's happening in the flocculation chamber. So how are we reducing N over time? What, what does that math look like um, to have really um, uh, kind of a dN dt is, is the question. Um, okay, so the next, next few steps we'll be answering that and building equations so that we can incorporate this rate at which the particles are changing given the destabilization. Um, how does that changing in our flocculation chamber so that we can know how big the particles are going to be, how fast they're going to settle in our sedimentation chamber. Okay, so that's where we're heading next. We'll talk about the mixing conditions of flocculation and go from there. All right, uh, any questions? All right, so I will post a homework. Um, I will, yeah, I'll post the homework tonight. Um, so you'll have a week to do that. We'll talk about both homeworks next time. Um, I'll upload these notes with a few corrections tonight as well. And we'll see you Thursday.